I may, and, um, and ask you, if you're embedded in the Smith School in, in the University of Oxford, lots of thinking going on there about the future of the environment. Um, wh what, are, what, is the, what are the emerging thoughts on how investment in, in nature is going to go forward over the next few years? Well, I can give you mine, Robin, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me say three quick things. So first of all, I think we're quite far from an operational definition of nature that helps us actually get this going. Some people, when they talk about nature, they're talking about the sheer amount of photos photosynthesis that happens on the planet, the terrestrial oceanic sinks, the net primary productivity. That's one measure. That number's going actually, up, actually, right? The planet's greening. If you ask ecologists, they will tell you that the measure of nature is the amount of interconnected landscapes and seascapes in which habitat uh, exist for species that are actually dwindling. That number is actually going down. Um, some people might say that it's the genetic or, uh, or phen phenotypic diversity, the sort of biological diversity that's in the stock of nature. That's really what we mean when we measure nature, right? Um, and that's in some intact landscapes, but it's also in places like soils, for example. Um, others will say, you know, when we talk about investing in nature, we're talking about uh, ecosystem services. We're talking about those things like a reef that protects a coastline from erosion. Well, that definition depends on people being there, which by definition almost says it's not about those intact ecosystems where people, most people don't live. Um, and then others, many who I know, would say that Central Park is nature. You know, it's a biodiverse asset. Um, uh, you know, migratory species of birds land there on their way along the flyways of North America. Uh, it's only valuable. You know, the views from those extraordinary extraordinarily high uh, buildings around it are very, very valuable because of Central Park. But it's entirely architected and landscaped. So this is a complete human construction, which is an expression of culture. So, you know, there, there's an enormous segmentation in what we mean about nature. Even if we narrow to carbon, uh, not all carbon is the same, right? Even if though we want uh, carbon to be sucked out of the atmosphere, but a tree planted may suck out, uh, uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, but it's only a mixed forest, a real live ecosystem that can last for a long time. You know, the Amazon's been there probably since the last glacial maximum, that's 20,000 years. Some trees have been there for millions of years. That's longer, not just than any technology we have, but longer than our species has been on the planet. So that's a different carbon from a tree that's been planted yesterday. So there are these differences of segmentation, and we don't really have a synthesis for what we mean about uh, when, we, when we talk about nature. And, and it's not just a scientific process, I should add. This is about what our home looks like. And so it's actually an inherently political process, not just a question that scientists uh, can answer. Um, certainly, you know, Reverend, if I may just add two other points on this, uh, maintaining any one of these, whatever mix we come up with, is going to cost money, uh, not all of which is financeable. Um, because there are not going to be cash flows attached to many of these changes. There are some. Uh, for example, land-intensive companies, if you think of water companies as an example, water companies invest in the watershed to improve the flow of water. They probably have an impact on nature. Those investments are paid for out of operating budgets that are actually financed through uh, corporate or municipal bonds, depending on what uh, those institutions are. But we are very far from linking uh, the performance of financial performance of those instruments to the biophysical performance of the investments those companies uh, those companies are making. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one of the things I'm looking at a lot is, is the question of how measuring those biophysical outcomes can change this game. We're in the midst of an Earth systems monitoring revolution. Uh, we, have, we know more about the surface of the planet than we never know. Uh, you know, with one of my hats, I'm a, I'm a founder of a company called Chloris Geospatial that measures carbon and stock and change across the planet everywhere uh, now. There are other companies that are doing the same. And what we're trying to all do is link the biophysical performance of actions on the ground to the financial performance of the instruments that get developed. We're at the very, uh, the very early stages of all of that. Um, but I'll just close by saying, Robin, that I, I do want to emphasize this is not just a scientific question. Ultimately, what we're talking about when we're talking about nature is what does our home look like? And for that, you need people to agree. And it's fundamentally a political process that's needed. Th thank you, Julia. So you've, you've emphasized the importance of being able to measure outcomes and the services provided by these, these natural assets. Um, you talked about water as, as one example as how revenue streams could be created. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts about other sources of revenue that could be attached to these metrics that you've been discussing? 
Well, the good news is that there's a number, of, there's an increasing number of um, ventures and companies that intermediate the landscape. By virtue of transitioning to a renewable energy platform, we're essentially uh, exchanging millions of years of sunlight in one place captured by fossil fuels for one day of sunlight over the entire landscape. And as a, as a function of that, we'll be modifying the landscape and attaching cash flows to modifications of the landscape. So renewable companies are another good example of where, you know, there are going to be very real cash flows attached to real assets that correspond to investments in land use that change the biomass and the biophysics of that landscape. The problem is we don't have very good definitions of what we're aiming for. Um, and therefore, we can't really reward in an effective way um, those investments. Uh, carbon is the best we can at the moment. But as I said, the, the difference between a, a mixed forest that's been there for a thousand years and a plantation is not uniformly acknowledged, right? So we have a long way to go before we can actually uh, capture nature outcomes in the financial investments that are currently going to the carbon transition. Thank you very much, Julia. We'll come back to the studio now and invite Tony to tell us a little bit about what's going on on the TNFD front. Uh, we've seen the enormous impact that the TCFD on carbon has had in the financial community with the stress testing activities that are going on alongside Paris alignment and how that's really starting to move thinking quite a lot. Um, where, where are we with TNFD and what are your hopes for that? Well, I think um, uh, you know, we've been described as the new kid on the block in, in, the, in the sort of um, landscape of all of these initiatives. But I think our mission really is to um, provide the sort of investment grade data and information that can inform better decision making around nature related uh, impacts and dependencies. And without understanding the impacts and dependencies, it's very hard to understand the risks and the opportunities that then flow from that. So that, in a sense, that's really our mission. Um, and I think what's striking to pick up on Hugh's comment before is, um, this is my first COP, but talking to people who've been coming for, to COPs for 10, 15 years, there is this sense this has been a, a sort of a positive tipping point moment for nature at this COP, that we're seeing uh, nature embedded through the discussion, certainly over the five days that I've been here. And in fact, the first big announcement was on deforestation. So. I think, I think the conversation has really shifted. Uh, I think there's a real appreciation now that, um, that nature is the flip side of the same coin as, as climate. We can't get to net zero if we're not nature positive. Um, and so I think you know, the, the real question now for corporate leaders and for investors, I think, is, 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 is this point, which is I think it's less about if we're going to have uh, nature-related uh, risk disclosures and more about when now and the question is how fast is that going to come? So Hugh made the point that it's you know, we're five or six years after TCFD um, Being ambitious we'd like to think we can start creating an impact and move faster than that But we are very much going down the same trajectory of being a voluntary uh, Market-led initiative which may end up in a glide path to to mandatory requirements, but that will ultimately be for regulators to decide um, So, you know my first point would be that I think this is coming uh, the second point, uh, really picking up uh, on, on the comments about how complex it is to understand nature, this is a complicated task. Um, so while we have the endorsement of the G7 and the G20, na uh, breaking down nature and understanding nature and putting that into a construct that investors and corporate decision makers can actually use is, is really the essence of our challenge. Um, and in fact, Mark Carney was talking yesterday about TNFD and he said it's far more complicated than the TCFD uh, task of, of, of uh, constructing a framework around climate. We don't have, a, you know, we don't have targets like 1.5 and 2 degrees. We don't have scope emissions as a construct. Uh, we don't have net zero as a, as a sort of guiding or as aspirational strategy for action. We're going to have to create those, those elements uh, in order to mobilize the action that we want to see. And so the third point I'd make is that we, we have to have a collaborative market-led approach to this. And that really speaks to the design of the TNFD. So uh, we were announced in, in June. We had the first um, uh, meeting of the task force uh, less than a month ago. In fact, we've had two, two meetings of the task force to get ourselves uh, fully mobilized. Uh, we've got 30, 33 uh, companies, financial institutions, and market intermediaries from uh, around the world uh, involved across all continents. Uh, we could have been easily oversubscribed with financial institutions from Europe and the US, but we, we worked very hard to make sure we had 
representation across geographies and across sectors. So we've got forestry companies in, 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 in Latin America, we've got uh, financial institutions in Africa, we've got insurers from Asia. So it's a very diverse um, task force that we've built. And underneath the task force is what we've called the TNFD Forum, uh, which has quickly grown to over 200 institutions that are supporting our mission and signaling that they're making themselves available to support our work. So that's tremendously exciting because um, in addition to the support we've got from academic and conservation partners, um, the approach we're taking to building out the framework, we've got two years to, to come up with a framework, but distinct from the TCFD approach, we're taking a sort of software development, uh, open innovation approach to building out the framework. So we're actually coming out with something quite early uh, to give the market a sense of the construct that we think uh, should constitute this framework for nature-related risk uh, assessment. And we, wanted, we want to evolve that and develop that with the benefit of feedback from the market. Um, we're, we're not going to go away for 12 months before we, we come out with something and release it. So that's a different approach to CCFD, um, but we want to inv involve the market participants as quickly as we can and benefit from feedback because we think, given the complexity of the task and the urgency of the task, that's the best approach forward for developing the framework. So, How do you think the TNFD, once it's been developed, will affect both disinvestment and investment decisions in nature? What, what are the pathways through which that change happens? Yeah, uh, well, I think what, we're, what we would aspire to see it, uh, once the framework's developed is that we're informing a number of different types of corporate and investment decisions. So decisions around strategy, uh, decisions around risk, and decisions around capital allocation. Um, it, while, while we're building a risk uh, management and disclosure framework, this isn't just about disclosure and, and, and you know, what companies will put in their 10K annual reports, et cetera. We think the value of the framework, if we can get it right, is actually um, very much at the C-suite level. It's, it should be fundamental to, to issues of strategy and growth. And if, we, if companies using the framework can understand where the, where the impacts and the dependencies lie and reveal both risks and opportunities, then the capital can, can flow into those uh, investment opportunities and projects that are inherently more nature positive. Um, and for, for investors, uh, having comparable data across an industry or across a an ecosystem will enable them to, in, to make better informed decisions about where to deploy capital based on uh, consideration of nature-related risk. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're now going to, to um, leave the investment lens from a, from a financial lens perspective a little bit and, um, and uh, sweeten the discussion with some real uh, economy examples uh, by turning to Nessa. Nessa, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was actually a great segue, that last session, because um, I think as we look at what we invest in, um, so the context for us uh, as Brambles or CHEP is that we're a pallet pooling business. So our business model is inherently circular. So it's a share and reuse business model, which obviously is, is a very sustainable type of business model. We've moved from our you know, setting 2020 goals that was really about sort of getting us into a position where we were, I guess, focusing on doing less harm and improving our values and how we ran our organization. We've now moved beyond that and our 2025 goals are regenerative goals. And you talked a lot about investments and how do we make investment decisions to allocate capital? And it's both value and values driven. And I think, you know, you've heard a lot from the other speakers about how investors are now looking for a home to invest in companies that are sustainable. It doesn't take away the requirement for you to deliver performance to your shareholders in terms of commercial outcomes, but it does mean that shareholders are saying, I want to invest in a business that I know reputationally you're doing the right thing by a whole range of stakeholders and that you're investing in a way that you're protecting the reputation. And while I think TCFD was great in terms of, you know, you work out the risks, for companies like us that are in more leadership positions, it also creates a whole range of opportunities to take to take investment further. And so, you know, Barron's have rated us uh, number one and number two as the most sustainable company globally for two for two years. Oh. We're number eighteen on the corporate nights, uh, AAA rated MSCI. So we are getting recognition for what we do, and there's a real value to us. You know, we get employees want to join us because of our reputation and, and what we're doing. Um, we recognize that to be leaders in this position, it's not just about lowering our own carbon footprint, 
it's actually collaborating across supply chains. So, you know, we hear about companies that might have one or two collaborations. We have over 100 collaborations with different customers where we're either working with them to eliminate waste in their supply chains or, you know, really interesting, and particularly in Europe, looking at empty transport miles and, and mapping those with people who need transport miles. So we're, we're actually creating a value. So our business model is creating a value or unlocking a value that was inherently latent in the economy, but was obviously a key issue in terms of overall global footprint. We're now finding that not only gives us big wins with our customers because they see we're benefiting them, but also the knock-on impact for that is we're now seeing, and it's in our sustainability report for anybody who wants to look closer at what we're doing, um, we have our customers using us as testimonials because they know when we do things and we talk about the importance of measurement systems. I love the piece about how do we define what nature is? How do we get a better measurement system? Because I think that advances us and makes sure we're making real improvements. So I think one of the questions that, that you asked me for this, Robin, was, you know, how do we make sure we get credibility or we get the credit for what we're doing? And, and, you know, I think a piece of that is because we do have good measurement systems that all the way along, we were really conscious about making sure we didn't get into a greenwashing situation. And now as the conversation moves on, so, so we've now got, of the work we've done, we've now got 100% sustainable sourcing of, of, of lumber globally. And, you know, we actually invested in forests where we needed to and invested in getting them certified to make sure that we were able to deliver that outcome to the business. But I think it's really important when we talk about investing in nature, we don't just stop at investing in the nature itself. Particularly as corporates, we should be thinking about how do we use those resources then really efficiently? So we shamelessly stole um, that in working with partnerships with um, you know, technology that was widely available in sawmills, for instance, in Europe. And we co-invested with sawmill owners in the US. And that, that took out a whole reprocessing for making our pallets but also gives us better yield on the lumber. So not only should you be about replacing what you use, we're now moving to, instead of just replacing for an equivalent tree, we're saying we actually want to replace with two trees and therefore we, want to go, we need to go beyond our four walls. So within our business for scope one, scope two, as of June this year, we were net carbon neutral, but now we're saying scope three and we're largely transport. That's much more challenging and it's gonna involve a lot more collaboration. So. For us, the investments and where we want to go are very much linked to our business, but very much thinking about eliminating waste, but also thinking about the value and the opportunities that we can get out of continuing to be leaders in, in this space. We see it as a, a huge opportunity for corporates, and I'd love to see more corporates doing it. Um, and you know, I think it's great that this is such a big topic and that investors are pushing us to do it, customers are pushing us to do it. Employees are making choices about the companies they join because of it. And socially, people are challenging companies that aren't engaging. So I think that's, I think that's all very, very positive uh, in terms of movement. Th th thanks, Nessa. So it's impressive what you've achieved with such focus. I, can you tell us a little bit more about where you want, where, where would the next level be if you take it, as you take it forward? And uh, sometimes in these discussions, you hear people talking about new business creation green business creation and, and, and unlocking value in that way. Are there other things ahead you see for, for, for Brambles in, in that area, for example? Well, for us, we are working on a sort of a, a transformation now, looking, saying, how can we use, we have a load of data in our business and saying, how can we use technology better to use that to get much more efficient global supply chains? That's about eliminating waste. So, you know, you think about asset turns. If we can improve asset turns in our business, that's great for us in terms of our return on capital, in terms of our cash, but also means that you don't have to pull the, the pricing lever as hard with customers. If you can engage customers on a win-win, how do you how do you take out, take out waste? And it also means that ultimately to run the same pallet pool and service the same level of customers, you need less pallets. Uh, we're also investing in durability and new materials, looking at how can we change things around to make the pallets even more durable than they currently are? So how do we lose less pallets? How do we make them more du durable? How do we use data and technology and, 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 and have real-time data and communications with customers to improve the overall efficiency? So we're working on a number of really exciting projects in that area, and we're very excited about the potential for us and for our customers, but also in terms of our carbon footprint. Um, we've also hired a director for decarbonization that we've put into our 
um, uh, supply chain. I, I gather we're quite leading edge on this at the moment. And what we're trying to do is make sure we have a really good understanding of what's our base position now. And it comes down to all these debates about how do you measure all the various components. So how do we lock in how we measure that? And then how do we use that to set a, a really important glide path for us to get to these longer term um, reductions? And that'll help inform, you know, as we're doing transformation and as we're making changes, we're capturing these things now and seeking to get good, uh, rigorous capture of all those initiatives so that that can be part of our story as we go forward. But there is real value in that to us and to our customers and employees. And there's real end economic value. So I think it's taking it to the next level for us is, is really how we see it. I think, I think this is a tremendous example. You are, you are a tremendous example, Nessa, of how bringing together the role of chief finance officer with chief sustainability officer into one place gives you such a clear, clear uh, vision as to what, as what you're trying to achieve in this area. Now, let, let's turn to uh, Nicola. Uh, thank you very much for uh, staying in, in Glasgow for a little bit longer to join us, Nicola, and before you go off to, to, to Hong Kong. Um, tell us a little bit about what your plans are in this area and, and, and what you think needs to happen to, to drive investment into nature and stop the disinvestment that's been taking place. Yeah. So, so there's two, two streams of work that we are operating in the investment world. The first one are very much along uh, investing into nature-based assets, forestry or farms, where we try to restore um, and, and uh, rebuild nature. And that's what we do with our partner, Pollination, through climate asset management, which is a new venture that we have uh, launched. And it's really about uh, providing capital into uh, fields that are uh, to be re rebuilt from a nature standpoint and providing investor with both a financial return because you take, uh, for example, a corn field that you transform into, uh, into an almond tree field or into a more diverse uh, land. And uh, so get to the investor both the return, um, the financial return and also some carbon uh, credit. So that's one field of work that we are doing. The other one is through engagement and stewardship um, We've signed the Biodiversity Pledge for Finance, and, and through this pledge, uh, we commit to engage with uh, the company we invest in on how they deal with biodiversity risk uh, or opportunity. And I think that that's very important. First, it's a, a very new uh, art, I would say, as we've commented a lot. Uh, we've been working on carbon for, for now 10 to 15 years, so even if we are not there completely, we begin to understand uh, the impact of um, industrial processes on carbon consumption and, and production, uh, and what we need to do sector by sector to limit the carbon intensity of a business or how people are transitioning. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, this is much more nascent. This is the very beginning, and so we are doing it sector by sector. Uh, we are participating to various working groups that help us to understand better the biodiversity impact of some sector of industry. Um, the first one we are working on is food, uh, the food industry, so that we can work and engage uh, with the food company we are invested in to understand better uh, their sourcing strategy, uh, what type of farmers they are uh, working with to, to source their uh, the, the, you know, the raw materials they need to transform and to build uh, the food that they are selling. Um, and I think that uh, will be more and more important and that will require more and more work on our part to better understand the impact and try through engagement with companies to drive better outcome uh, for nature. What, what sort of um, uh, geographical opportunities do you see in, in, for example, the investments in land that you've been talking about? So um, I think there's two types of uh, work that we can do. Uh, today, our investor, uh, they often, uh, they are always fiduciary to someone, uh, meaning that could be pensioners that they need to work for. If it's a well, sovereign wealth fund, they've got their own rules toward to protect the wealth of the country. So they have all uh, rules that make them very cautious about how they invest the money, which is, I think, very natural. 
so what we see as an appetite today is mostly for projects in developed countries. Um, so we are looking at two projects in Portugal, another one in Australia. Um, because you invest very long term in these projects. Uh, you know, trees take time to grow. So it's, um, you know, the maturity of this product is 15 years. So it's very long time, long term. Um, so the investor wants to have a certainty in terms of um, the uh, ownership of the land, uh, the regulatory framework. Uh, so geopolitical risk is something they are very scared about. So that's one type of product. The other product we are doing is quite different and could be more controversial because we are talking about offset here, is that we would be working uh, with uh, government in uh, developing countries uh, to restore their land. Uh, and so we take a concession uh, and we invest in the restoration of the land and we get the carbon credit against it. Uh, and we do that for, let's say, a contract of 10 years or 15 years. Uh, uh, so for investor, they don't get a financial return, but they get a flow of carbon offset for the coming 10 to 15 years that is going Um, and so we put at work, let's say eighty percent in the restoration of mangroves, for example and 20% are used during the, the life of the project to make sure that this mangrove is in, in good shape. And how do you deal with this, the sovereign risk in, uh, of investing in those That's, developing situations? That will be uh, a risk. Right. You wear it. <laughs> yeah. So that's our job to work with, um, you know, in places where we feel that the investment of our uh, investors is secure. Yeah. Oh, in some occasions, development finance institutions would come into play there and take some of that risk away. Are, are they doing yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, not, it's too early yet, but that's, uh, yeah, for some projects, we might work with uh, development banks to secure these projects, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you all for um, completing that first round. Uh, and um, I'm going to share a few questions now which have come in. Um, so, um, by all means, in a, in a moment when we go around for a second, for a second tour, uh, to pick whichever of those questions you, you wish or, or reflect on things that other panelists have said. So, let, just listen for a, for a second. Um, what kind of time horizon should we be talking about when we're, when we're looking at investment in nature? Does that create special requirements on permanency? What sorts of nature positive investments are gaining traction? Nicola, you've talked about a few, and, and, and Divya, you've mentioned some. Um, should we be thinking about recognizing, uh, for example, the, the capacity, the productive capacity of agriculture soil in the balance sheet or the carbon in soil in, in a balance sheet, and how might that happen? Uh, and what does it take for a company to have a meaningful nature positive transformation? if someone was to make such a commitment. So there's three questions. Um, maybe I can add um, one more, which is, um, which is your best guess as to when investment will start flowing at really large scale and this will become a mainstream activity, if you, if you think it will, in fact, um, what your best guess as to what that time horizon is. Um, to keep things simple, we'll go in the same order again, if that's okay. So Divya, would you like to go first? Sure, I'll actually pick your last, your last question up. When does it start? And it ties into something Hugh was saying about um, a diversified portfolio. I think with nature, it's slightly different. It's not like this has been, you know, people are starting to invest in this stuff all of a sudden. Um, we've been investing in nature as, uh, you know, as one of the earliest investments humankind has made. We're farmers, right? So <laughs> this is not new. Um, and it's been done by, you know, large families, foundations, 
private equity managers, um, and to suddenly, I, I worry that as people say, well, we'll just have a portfolio approach, we'll do a bit of farming, there's a science and a methodology to it. It isn't sort of something you dabble in. Forestry and ag is a huge uh, 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 asset management industry, and people have been doing it. So this is not new. What we're trying to do differently is apply different scales of how we approach nature. And, um, uh, you know, what was also mentioned was the different ways you can do it. So, you know, phenotypic versus genetic expression was brought up. Um, there are various measures. I would take all of those measures and distill them back to what we do best, which is risk-based analysis, um, and, and really bang on about that. Because if we don't do it in a risk-based way, those measures are kind of, and that is what TCFD does so well, and I'm hoping TNFD picks up for nature, is that we've got to think about this in a risk-based way. So a good example would be us agriculture. Now everyone's buzzword is sustainable agriculture. I, I would argue a lot of it is fairly sustainable. Some of it's not very sustainable at all. Um, what we haven't been doing in agriculture, for example, is uh, we've been narrowing our pheno you know, the, the genotype. So um, when we talk about risk-based approach in the future, we're moving from a, a world where averages have applied uh, and we've, we've operated in a rather narrow band to we're now operating in an expanded band of climatic uh, uh, scenarios, uh, a lot of drought, too much water. And when you've got projects that are, doing, that are now exposed to that, asset managers who've been in ag have to do sustainable ag, which is really, we have to deal with the whole host of uh, scenarios. And that's when something like phenotypic and genotypes come into play. If we've gone down a band where we have said, we're going to maximize yield and sustainable agriculture, but we're narrowing the genes. It means that these plants are really great at performing, you know, for exams, exam conditions. But when they're exposed to a variety of conditions, they die. Uh, and that's great for some ag companies because they sell you the aftermarket product of pesticides, of things that actually destroy the land. Um, we are now sustainable ag. What it really means is we're doing ag like we've always done before. We have a larger range of climate. And what we need to be looking at from a risk-based perspective is increasing the genotype. So the phenotypic expression of a wild plant, for example, can deal with a variety of circumstances. And so if you're thinking about science-based investing, we're investing in the kind of varietals that needs to be put out there. If you're an asset investor, you need to be looking at these sorts of risks, distilling down everything from biodiversity, from uh, you know, the genotypic, uh, uh, phenotypic expression, uh, and interactions, and thinking about how it affects your investment from a risk-based perspective, because that the range of interactions you're going to be seeing is not going away. We're not going to solve that problem. That's happened. So let's try and work on that. Fantastic. So science-based, risk-based investing. Science-based, fact-based investing, and it's nothing new. I, I keep saying that because when you, when you meet investors, the investors who've invested in the sector are very clued up. What we are seeing is a whole host of new investors wanting to come in, thinking that they can dabble in it like they've dabbled in, in telecoms. And it's kind of not like that, because there's a whole industry that's been doing forestry and ag for years. Mm. Um, and, and, and they're not stupid. <laughs> you know, they're not evil. They are seeing these, they're the ones who've seen these climatic variations more than anyone else. And they, you know, like Bramble, they are, they are grappling with this. And we need to start, you know, considering how that, that is sustainable and we can, we can progress it from a risk-based, fact-based, science-based approach. Thank you very much, Divya. Um, Hugh, would you like to come in? Uh, well, thanks, Robin. I mean, look, I agree with, uh, with Div what Divya has, has just said. Um, I think I was going to take the one about the sort of time horizon. The big challenge here is how we scale capital and how we provide the underpinnings for that scaling, whether it be the data and metrics, whether it be uh, understanding, do, do, you know, some re good quality research, which I'm sure Julia and others can do around the, what, what is the impact on the portfolio of some of these measures. And then obviously think, and then third, being open to innovation, really accepting there is no one right way to invest in this space. It's actually, we should be open to a, a degree of investing. And I think that mainstreaming is really critical. So at one level, as uh, you said, it may be frustrating having newcomers coming into a sector which may not be as clued up and as sophisticated as 
uh, as the insiders. But on the other hand, for the scale of the challenge that we on what this panel, I think, are just debating today, we need to find ways to actually mainstream uh, this and also and engage much more broadly. So I think um, you know, my sense would be uh, some of this will come through thematic investing. So it could be the sustainable development goals uh, type funds that I mentioned earlier. It could be water related funds. Um, obviously, there are a number of water related uh, investors out there already. One of the challenges is um, in that case, it's more investing in developed markets because the providers of you know, water, environmental services, water technology and so forth are predominantly in the West rather than emerging markets. And I think it would be a shame, you know, whilst, you know, every investor wants to make money and if that's the right way to, to go for it, that we, that, that's, that's terrific. Part of this is really helping with the uh, protection and uh, 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 husbanding of uh, nature um, in emerging markets. So I think one of the keys for me from this discussion is we need to bring along additional um, private sector capital. But going back to what I said earlier, one of my big disappointments from COP was nothing from the development banks. And I think there really is a real gap, which I think as we go away and reflect, uh, we need to think about and work on post this COP. Thanks, Hugh. That, that's a, a fantastic exam question for another occasion, which is how do we do this in emerging markets? I think that's terrific to have set, set that debate up for the future. Um, Julia, could we come to you next, please? Yeah, I just want to build on the comments that have just been made. I mean, first of all, we've been sort of lucky because we've dealt with carbon, which happens to be one molecule attached to the most expensive input of the productive economy. So tracking that's been sort of, you know, we, we haven't done that well, but tracking it is relatively easy compared to the complicated set of biophysical uh, outcomes that we will have to track in order to come to some definition of nature. And here, I think I agree with the Divya, you know, synthesis may be our enemy because some things will be susceptible to project and corporate finance and others won't. And the distinction will be important. Some things are investable. Uh, you know, a forest can be managed sustainably or not sustainably, but uh, maintaining an intact ecosystem where nobody lives, but where many species are disappearing may not be susceptible to the corporate balance sheet. I mean, we have to just recognize that. And it's unhelpful to think of all of this as just nature. Um, and therefore, the last thing I'll say is, there are sectors and segments from forestry, from agribusinesses, from food, water, energy, where there are tangible biophysical changes that can be measured today that could be built into the business cases of those investments. But where there aren't, we need business voice to bring in sovereign actors and international actors to play their role. This ultimately is a political issue. Individual nations need to decide what their landscape looks like. And that doesn't happen without institutions that have a popular and sovereign mandate. Thank, thanks, Julio. Tony? I, I will leave it to others to talk about uh, the deployment of capital as investment managers. But I think... Um, uh, you raised the issue of soil, uh, and we're here in Scotland where I believe 25% of Scotland is peat. Uh, and, you know, Hank Paulson, the former Treasury Secretary, has talked about soil as a new asset class. So I think um, this is an, should be an incredibly exciting time to be architecting new commercial models. It, it sort of reminds me of the late 1990s when we were all discovering the internet and getting phones, and there was this explosion of different digital business models, many of which we'd look back now and say that was a crazy idea. Of course it was going to fail, but at the time everyone was pushing out new and exploratory business models to see what was going to work in this in this frontier of digital innovation. Well, it feels to me we're in that stage now around uh, natural capital. Um, and if, if we just look at what's happening, we've got, you know, voluntary carbon markets are scaling, uh, soil as an asset class, people talking about biodiversity credits. There's a lot of disparate innovation happening, and I think the real opportunity is for the entrepreneurs to be putting those things together and creating new business models. Um, and, and that needs to be reflected and rewarded in the information that folks like us hopefully will come up with so that it's very clear where the capital should be, should be directed. Thanks, Tony. Nessa, are you feeling entrepreneurial about uh, soils and these other opportunities? <laughs> well, I think that the more we get these measures and we get them agreed so we can use them in a way that actually is credible and we can measure them and use them, then they can be a reliable input. If you don't have an agreed definition, it's very hard to base decisions on it. And TCFD was the first step. We have to move to nature. And there are companies like ours who are very passionate about these topics who want to actually collaborate to find out better ways to, to do this so that we can incorporate it. 
and, and look for ways to get value out of it. Part of our job is to stand on the other side in businesses and say, how can we unlock value from this? So I agree uh, with Julia, you can't monetize everything. But I do think within businesses, we have to be more creative about our business models, how we go to market to unlock value, how we how we make assets more, more durable. And then I, I think there needs to be, you talk politically there as well about what we need to do. I think we need to lobby for the changes that we need across industries that will allow people to, to get to a better place. If you want circular business models, you need to have better, better title to assets ac across the globe. That's just one, one example. And you know, if you want to change things to do with emissions on transport, what standards are you setting in various countries? It is going to take a bigger co collective and collaborative effort to, to get there. Um, but I think these are all the right conversations to start having. Thank, thank, thank you, Nessa. Nicola. Yeah, I think um, one of the reflections is uh, cutting a tree is immediate. Uh, having the effect of the plantation of a tree uh, takes a, a, a generation. So uh, there will be some money coming into nature capital. It will not be enough. Uh, but the urgency is really to stop deforestation um, and also to push people uh, for a more uh, diverse and sustainable uh, farming through the sourcing of, of products. And so for us, the financial sector, so developing the product we are developing, I think, makes perfect sense and is good and should be pushed. But through uh, engagement stewardship, we need to direct capital uh, to companies that have uh, the, the right behavior, uh, because that is really where we can stop um, the degradation of, um, you know, of, of the cultures and all the nature that we have around us. Thank you, Nicola. Um, well, it falls to me to wrap up. Um, we had thought about calling these sessions hero sessions. Uh, because we have inspiring leaders in the rooms coming to talk to us about the ways in which they're tackling these enormous global problems, highly entrepreneurially solving these difficult problems, uh, metrics, investing in emerging markets, dealing with the science, engaging uh, investors in new opportunities and products, and transforming organizations and, and the services that are providing for for clients, and you heard, you've heard examples of all of that today. So in a minute, I would like to ask you to put your hands together and, uh, in a sign of appreciation and to, and to say thank you to uh, Divya Sasha Mani from Greensill Capital, to Hugh Van Steenis from UBS, uh, to uh, Giulio Boccoletti from the University of Oxford, to Tony Golder from uh, TNFD, to Nessa O'Sullivan from Brambles, and from Nicolo Moho from HSBC Global Asset Management. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you very much to all of you who've joined us online or joined us in the studio. This is the end of the broadcast. <laughs>